and we have the chairman of women, chairman of women here on New Earth Television. You're live. Hi, welcome to Determined Women. As you know, our show Airplay, which gives play to lots and lots of theater, lots of playwrights, lots of actors, lots of directors, and connects people all the time. Um, this is a special segment. Once a month or thereabouts, we do an interview with women that have been legacies in the theater that have done tons and tons of things to, determined to do theater no matter what, which is really good today because we're in this situation, but we're surviving. And as you know, live theater is really, really coming along and it's we're bouncing back. So with me today is my co-host, Carrie Wesolowski, and she's going to tell you who's on the show. Hi, Connie. Yes. So our guest today on Determined Women is Linda S. Nelson. Linda S. Nelson is an actor, director, dramaturg, and producer. As an actor, Ms. Nelson has predominantly been seen on stage, including off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, regional theater, and with companies such as White Horse Theater, Oberon Theater Ensemble, Boomerang Theater, and New Jersey Rep. Her film and TV credits include Imaginary Heroes with Sigourney Weaver, Orange is the New Black, Seven Deadly Sins, and the award-winning short film, Lipstick Ladies. In addition to directing dozens of readings, short plays, and 24-hour festivals for companies such as Boomerang, TRU, Oberon, and New Light Theater, her New York directing credits include Toast, Boast, or Roast, a tribute to Austin Pendleton, featuring Olympia Dukakis, Louis Zorick, F. Murray Abraham, Dylan Baker, and Becky Ann Baker at the Players Club, produced by Oberon Theater Ensemble, Tongue of a Bird by Ellen McLaughlin, The Necessary Disposal by Bob Ost, and the Backstage Bistro award-winning Three Tenors in Search of an Act. She also directed and produced the world premiere and tour of Missa Solemnis, or The Play About Henry by Roman Fieser the North American premiere of The Choice by Claire Luckham, and two interactive murder mysteries, The Art of Murder and Delicious Death, both of which she co-wrote. As a dramaturg, Ms. Nelson has worked with dozens of writers, including playwright novelist Colleen Heffernan, screenwriter Michael Lee Stever, and playwright Cindy Marion at White, House, White Horse Theater Company, Stu Rochelle, Roman Fieser, Bob Oust, and Phil Olson on his popular music series, Don't Hug Me. Founder of Shotgun Productions, she served as its producing director for 19 years and produced theater, drama, opera, and classical concerts throughout the New York area and in Europe. Since leaving Shotgun, she has independently produced plays in NYC and on tour throughout the US. She was an associate producer on the off-Broadway production of Silence, the musical parody of Silence of the Lambs. Currently, she represents the multi-award-winning Sweet Texas Reckoning by Tracy Godfrey and the solo performance, Vietnam Through My Lens, written and performed by Stu Rochelle. With Vietnam, she started as its dramaturg, then produced and directed the NYC premiere in 2014 and has continued as its producer director of the tour, which has been running since then. Vietnam was also made into a film last summer by Two Seas TV, on which she worked as the AD to the Emmy Award-winning director, Tony Siglio. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow, what an yeah, inspiration. Really? <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. And welcome, Linda. Welcome, Linda. Thanks. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to meet you and see you today. And for everybody watching and listening, tell us the question all, everybody always asks. How did you get started in this business? What brought you into the world of theater? Um, yeah, that's uh, so much of what brought me into theater was honestly, it was happenstance. I... Um, it started when I was eight years old and I was obsessed with Abraham Lincoln, not because he was a great president or because of his work to abolish slavery, but because 
his birthday was the same day as my sister's. So that had to be important. I mean, you know, come on, I was eight years old. So, so one weekend I went home and I memorized the Gettysburg Address. And when I came to school on Monday, I insisted on performing it for my teacher, Faye Brown. And Faye, I guess, decided that I needed to be on stage. So she cast me as a bat in a Halloween play. And <laughs> I guess the Gettysburg Address was my first audition. But anyway, I was hooked after that. And I immediately thereafter started writing, directing, building sets out of court cardboard boxes, producing before I even knew what producing was. And for anywhere I could get an audience at you know, school plays, at talent shows, later on community theater. And it was a bit of a challenge because I was raised in Ogden, Utah. And back then there weren't a lot of opportunities in Utah. Now that's very different. There's a lot of arts going on all over the state. But back then it was kind of a challenge and I didn't come from an artistic family. I mean, my mother was a registered nurse and my father was a civil engineer and there was not a opera singer or a poet or an artist or even a juggler in my family and they uh, all kind of thought I was a little weird. Um, my sisters had convinced me that I was left on the doorstep by the police. I was pretty gullible as a kid, but um, they all were really supportive, especially my parents. I mean, it was obvious that they would have preferred that I went in another direction, but they never said to me, no, you can't do that. So the plan for me was that I was going to go to the local college and major in education, and I was going to take over for the drama coach at my high school, Ruth Darrington. And then I had a really, really bad audition. Um, I was still in high school, but the local college was opening up auditions in the community for their musical. I I think it was My Fair Lady, not sure, but that sounds right. And anyway, I auditioned thinking, oh, this is a shoe in for me. And after the audition, the director, who was the head of the theater department, pulled me aside and said, you certainly can't sing and you probably can't act. Have you thought about doing technical theater? And, oh God. I, I was mortified and I was, I was so embarrassed. I obviously couldn't go to that school. I couldn't show my face there. And Aww. I immediately started focusing on set design and lighting. And thank God from there, actually thanks to a debate scholarship, I ended up at Southern Utah University, which is the home of the Tony Award winning Utah Shakespearean Festival. And I received a much different education than what I had originally anticipated. Um, mm -hmm. The program at Southern Utah was very diverse and intense. And at least it was back then. I assume that it still is now. But you couldn't specialize in your chosen field for the first couple of years. You had to train in acting and directing and producing and lighting and set design and even makeup design and theater history. And it wasn't just a cursory education. It was, it was pretty intense. And so I, I surrounded myself kind of, again, by happenstance with these really incredible supportive people. And my freshman year, one of my favorite professors, Gary McIntyre, asked me, he goes, why do you think you're a techie? You belong on stage, not backstage. And he convinced me that yes, I certainly could act and sing, sort of. <laughs> and um, he got me back on stage. And the whole faculty there, R. Scott Phillips, Joseph Gilg, and the late incredible Fred C. Adams, who is the head of the department and also the founder and artistic director of Utah Shakespeare, they were all so supportive and they encouraged me to pursue theater 
as a profession and not just in the education field. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with a very broad background uh, in the arts with a degree in theater arts with an emphasis in directing. So in the end, I guess what brought me into theater and kept me there was kind of dumb luck. <laughs> I just, I had a lot of great opportunities that came to me and I just didn't shy away from them. But most of all, I had very supportive people around me, my family and my, my teachers and my mentors. And I could just follow my dreams and nobody ever said no, except, except for the director at the local college. So you were meant not to go there, you know? Yeah. Years later, I ran into him and he saw me on stage and was like, oh my God, why don't you go to our school? You could transfer. And I was like going, yeah, right. Gotta be kidding. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's amazing. So sometimes, you know, when we talk about determined, sometimes our path is determined for us. You know what I mean? And if it's in our heart, fate takes place, you know? Yeah, it really did. So how did you decide that this was your passion? Like what was the turning point in you? A lot of people are searching, especially today with theater being closed a lot of places. I mean, just imagine, I, I mean, I would kill myself if I was, I started out early in life in a job at Marriott and what, you, what if you were in hospitality? Cause that really took a dive now. So like kids in college right now, like how did you know this was your passion? Like your heart? Oh, there actually was kind of a, specific moment. Um, when I was a kid and through high school and college and people would ask me why I was in the theater, I, I really didn't have a good answer. I mean, because I loved it. And then I was cast in one of my dream roles as Beverly in Michael Christopher's award Pulitzer Prize winning play, The Shadow Box. And yeah. Beverly has this incredible monologue. I, know it. I won't bore you with the details. You can read the play Great. for yourself. And, um, but we were performing this in a very intimate um, horseshoe theater where the audience started at stage level and then went up from there. Mm -hmm. So the audience was just like a couple of feet away from the actors. And one night I was in the middle of this beautiful monologue and I, I heard something and through the imaginary fourth wall in front of us, I could, I could hear someone in the front row crying. I mean, really crying. And at that very moment, it just all clicked. To be able to, to create another character that, that you could give to a human being and, and make them feel something that deeply, whether it was to, to cry or laugh or think, most importantly, to make them think. Uh, um, I don't believe that I'm in theater to educate people or to preach to them from the stage, but I do believe that it's our job to make people think and to start the conversation whether it's a, a personal conversation or political or ethical, it, but that starts with making them feel. And um, a great example of this was years ago, I had the privilege to produce a wonderful play, Undivulged Crimes by Daphne Gill. It's been one of my favorite plays that I've ever had the privilege of, of producing. And it deals with the death penalty. It doesn't make a political statement. It doesn't choose the sides. It's actually a murder mystery of sorts. And the thing is though, it does make you start the conversation. Uh, anyway, the moment in the shadow box, being able to create a role that could affect the audience to that point, it, it was just being able to hear them sob a few feet away. It was like creating a ball of fire that I could just, hand over the proscenium arch to someone and move them to that point. And that was incredible. And at that moment, I knew where I, why I belonged where I was. 
Oh, I got to tell you that I know this speech very well. I know Beverly. We worked on that when I was an undergrad. My father died that year. He was 53 oh. years old. And I never thought my father would die. He was my rock. And I went back to college and I couldn't talk to anybody. And I absolutely just crumbled. And her speech in particular just blew me away. I cried during that speech too. And it's just so hard to deal with things like death. And when you have, and you're a young kid in college and something like that happens, theater does help. It does help. So I know exactly. And to start the conversation, I got to tell you a short thing about uh, Judith Malena. You know, remember uh, the um, Judith Malena and her, uh, um, I'm blanking right now, but she had that amazing theater that would always do something in the middle of Times Square, uh, the living theater, the living theater. Yes. And so, uh, you know, they were very political and they, every year they did a show about the death penalty and they mm -hmm. would do it in Times Square and she would get arrested and they would take her off to jail and she would do it and she would get arrested and they'd book her and everything. <laughs> She'd be there just long enough to get the show finished. And she said that people, the reaction was either people were like amazed and loving them or people would be so annoyed that they're blocking the street, you know? And so I said to her, but so why did you do it? And she said, because it would start the conversation. Some guy would go home and say, yeah, I'm late today because of these stupid theater people in the middle of everything and blah, 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 they're doing a play about the death penalty. And this play about the death penalty, they would pick and they would create it then and there about somebody who was actually at the death, on their death penalties, you know, right then and there. So the funny thing is, is that she actually would do this every year for one person that was going through their death. And she said that, you know, somebody go home and they'd complain during their dinner and some little kid would say, dad, what's the death penalty? Bingo, your conversation started, you know? Yeah, I think that's important now more than ever. And obviously not just about the death penalty, but right. everything that's going on with the country politically and on the issues that are being dealt with on personal levels. It's important. A that absolutely. We full talk. We make people think. We don't exactly. tell them what to think. We just make them think, think for Absolutely. themselves. Absolutely. So what's your advice for people starting out in this field? Newcomers, actors, directors, writers. What, I mean, what's your, what's your, what would you say to them if, if you had to give advice? And this is, this part of the show is for this. People listening to meet people like you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, that's kind of a hard one because over the years, my advice has changed. Um, decades ago, when I, I was mentoring um, new young producers in New York, uh, something I called the Producers Roundtable one-on-one. -on -one. And way back then when I started producing um, here, I, I and I founded Shotgun Productions, companies like Shotgun and Boomerang and Whitehorse and New Light and all the nonprofit theaters that are so incredible right now, they weren't around back then. They didn't exist or they were just getting started. So there was nowhere for me really to go to get advice or to get the help that I needed. Um, I was so grateful at that point for the education that I had um, at Southern Utah because I knew how to draft a production calendar. I knew how to draft a budget. And now there is an outstanding community of theater that, that can help you to get started. But back then I was mentoring these poor young first time producers and they didn't even know what a production calendar was or, or that they needed a budget. And I would tell them, my advice back then was just jump. Don't be afraid, don't hesitate. Don't second guess yourself, just jump. And if you make a mistake, learn from your mistake and, and pass it on, pay it forward. Yes. Now, a days, I still say just jump, but I also, more importantly, I tell people to take advantage of the numerous resources that are out there. Organizations like True, Theater Resources Unlimited and CTI Commercial Theater Institute and countless numbers of incredible non-for-profit theater companies, festivals, um, classes, seminars, workshops for 
producers, actors, writers. They're so plentiful now. And also, I this is advice that I would have taken had I been told. If you want to create theater, you can do it anywhere and at a very respectable level, not just New York, not in the streets, not in a structured theater, anywhere in the country or the world. But if you wanna make a living in the theater, you may want to consider focusing on what your passion really is, on what's important to you and seek out the people and the organizations and the resources that will support that goal. If you're an actor, find a, a great teacher or a class that can really nurture you. If you're a director or a stage manager or a designer, volunteer to be an intern at one of these great nonprofit theater companies. If you're a producer, if you are a producer, please, please join through. Theater Resources Unlimited gives you incredible support. And there is not another person in this city that is more supportive of young producers than Bob Ost. He runs true, he's been doing it for decades. He knows what he's doing. Listen to that man. <laughs> and yes, I still say just jump, but know that there are safety nets now. There are people out there, there are resources and people who really want to help and mentor you. And cultivate those relationships. Don't take them for granted. Right. Don't just call them when you need something. Call them when you have something to offer. Exactly, exactly. I believe there are three ways to get something done in this world. To do it yourself, to get help, and to give help. So that's mm -hmm. beautiful advice, Linda. It's, it's just beautiful. What's your passion project right now? What are you working on or what's the big thing in your life? Um, well, I do have a few readings coming up that I'm acting in and an audition and I'd like to get back on stage, but I do have a long-term ongoing passion project. And that, as she mentioned in my bio, is um, it's a solo performance that's written and performed by the incredibly talented Stu Rochelle. And it's called Vietnam Through My Lens. And I started on the project as Stu's dramaturg. He had a collection of stories that he had written about his experience as a soldier and as a combat photographer um, during his tour in Vietnam. And I was attracted to the piece because it wasn't um, a typical war story. Uh, it wasn't a political statement or wasn't about blood and guts. It was just one man's journey to, through, and beyond Vietnam. Wow. It focuses a lot on the people that he met while he was there and how it influenced his life after Vietnam as well. And it's sincere. It's funny. Um, um, it's very heartfelt. And it's it's very honest. And so we eventually developed the show to include video montages that were created by the filmmaker, uh, Michael Lee Stever. And he made the montages out of these photographs that Stu took while he was in service. And from there, we went on to premiere it. I morphed from dramaturg to producer director, and it was produced in New York City in 2014. And we received great reviews. So under the heading of be careful what you wish for, I said to Stu, you know, this would be a great piece to tour. <laughs> and so we have been touring it ever since. We assembled a great team of touring stage managers. It's led by Amy Hanalt and has Melissa E. Carroll and Benjamin Vigil. And we have played dozens of venues, um, just over a dozen venues, I should say. Um, including art centers and theaters like Guild Hall in the Hamptons and um, the Chianti Art Center in Southern Utah and tiny venues like a VFW Club in um, Delaware and, you know, hotel reception centers and, and uh, conference rooms and then larger venues like universities, um, universities from New Jersey to Western Illinois. And some really beautiful historical theaters like um, 
Kingsbury Hall in Salt Lake City and the, the Mishler Theater in Altoona, Pennsylvania and the Morganton Muni Municipal Auditorium in North Carolina. So we've gone from the very small to the very large. And of course, this came to a dead halt during the pandemic. So oh, sure. we are hoping to get it up on its feet again and touring. But in the meantime, um, last summer, a TV film was made of the performance by uh, the Emmy Award winning company, Two Seas TV. And they did a fabulous job putting this film together. They're um, trying to market it right now as we speak. And we've also had some great Zoom presentations of it that represented segments from the show. Most recently, we did a wonderful presentation at um, the via Zoom at the Schoolhouse Theater. That's led by the incredible uh, Bram Lewis and by his technical director, Steve Taylor. These are just really terrific people. So, and so how do we can we get see it, back it on the road again? That's that. <laughs> Can we see it now? Is there a way to see it now? You, well, hopefully they will get the film out there. Right okay. now it's, it's just being marketed. So okay. we don't have an answer for that yet, but you should go to our website. Okay. Easy to remember, Vietnam Through My Lens. It's www.vietnamthroughmylens.com. Love that. Go to the touring page. Cause I always post updates there of, of whatever's happening with the show. And that's a, a good way to keep in touch with us and, and know where we're headed next. Cool, cool. Well, we will definitely do that. I will definitely do that. I think, I think Vietnam was a, it's a very volatile, but yet it's a very important part of our history in America that we need to actually revisit. And especially now, you know, yeah, it really is. It really is. And I love the way, you know, I can tell the truth in the story from the way you presented it. You said to, through, and beyond. And I love that because that just gives me such, I want to know, I want to know, you know? Yeah, it's great. It talks about how Stu ended up going to Vietnam in the first place, the, the journey that he made to get there, kind of, he, he had opportunities to not go to Vietnam and he put himself out there with the idea that he didn't want to be down the road from where history was taking place. He felt like he wanted to be a part of this and he knew that this was an important part of our history, even back then when he was a young man. Uh, it's, so. it's just amazing to me, that whole experience. So I will definitely follow up and, and it's, learn more it's about terrific. it. It's terrific. And Stu does several characters. He's very, very funny, very talented. And it's it's a great experience. So I hope that you'll get a chance to see it in the future. I certainly long. will. I certainly will. Getting back to you though, before I let you go anywhere today, I want to know, your fondest memory in theater and in life? That's not a fair question. <laughs> um, there really isn't a specific single memory. I have been so lucky um, and to pick one of them would really be impossible. Uh, my time with Shotgun, um, while I was there, my partner Patricia Klausner and I actually produced an opera in Bulgaria in their national theater in Sofia. And if you would have told that eight year old bat several years ago that I was going to end up producing Tristan and Isolde in Bulgaria and that it would oh. be televised throughout Western Europe and there'd be oh. a double CD recording, I would have said that you were insane, but um, well, probably first I would have said, what's a CD? <laughs> But then I would have told you you were crazy. And it's just been these incredible opportunities. Also with Shotgun, we produced a very respectable reading series and it gave me the opportunity to work with playwrights such as Michael Christopher, who I mentioned earlier, wrote The Shadow Box. And we also worked with Alex Dinolaris on a couple of different projects. He went on to win Academy Awards and I got to work with actors like Deborah Monk and Kathleen Turner and Billy Zane, all with this little nonprofit theater company. And as an actor, um, I've been in films where I got to work with Sidney Lumet and Mike Nichols and with actors like Sigourney Weaver and McNulty and oh and Sam he Healy in Orange is the New Black was just a gift 
to work with. And then recently on Zoom, as an actor, I got to play opposite Michelle Hurd, Garrett Dillahunt, and Tracy Godfrey and her incredible play, Sweet Texas Reckoning, that I do hope someday to get a production of that up on its feet. And I've played so many of my dream roles. I've played, actually played De Beverly in the Shadow Box twice. Um, once, as I mentioned in college, and then it was a decade later, I pay, played her with a professional stock company. And I have played everything from hookers to queens to trailer trash to homeless people. I actually once played a um, psycho murderer. So I've kind of covered the gamut. I think one of my most fond memories as an actor was playing Mary in Richard Manley's Thank Emily. It's such a beautiful play. And I won the Best Actress Award at the American Globe Theater Festival for that. And I guess those are all these memories, but more important than that, I think I'd have to talk about the lessons that I've learned in theater more than the memories. And there isn't just one, but I think the most important lesson that I've learned is to take pride in, in what you do. Do your best and, and that will happen and, and choose projects that mean something to you. Whether it, it's something that you want to stand up for or whether because it's something you believe in or something that makes you laugh or, or cry, something that you're passionate about, choose those projects and, and the people. It's important that you choose people and companies that you respect and work with those people. I will always say yes to Cindy Marion at Whitehorse Theater. I will always say yes to Tim at Boomerang Theater, to Brad at Oberon Theater, to Sarah and Mike at New Light Theater, to Gabe and Suzanne at NJ Rep. They're all just incredible people. And I will walk over hot coals any day of the week to work with Colleen Heffernan again as, as a writer or as a director. She's it's an wonderful. amazing She's talent. wonderful. And these people, they're, they're almost as important to me as my family, which kind of brings us full circle for me. It, it's my family. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I, I would not be here. My parents were always there. They would fly across the country to see what I was acting in or directing or producing, whether it was here in New York or in Idaho, they were <laughs> always there. And once my parents passed, my two sisters and my niece and nephew really stepped up to the plate and oh. they've done the same. There are no two greater cheerleaders on this planet than my sisters. And, and when I've toured shows to Utah, they have not only, you know, packed a house with friends and family and, and helped to include my childhood friends, but they have housed and fed my cast and my crew. They have supplied props and set pieces so I didn't have to cart them all the way across the country. They have done everything they possibly could to help support my career. One sister even acted as my assistant director when I found myself in Salt Lake City short staffed. And you know, they're good That's people. That's deal. not too shabby considering that I was left on the doorstep by the police. You know, so <laughs> I guess the bottom line is that I, I was way too lucky. I just, I don't have necessarily a fond memory because I have been so fortunate to have so many great opportunities and supportive people and wonderful projects that I just, I just took advantage of them when they came my way. And I could never be more grateful. Than well, that. same with us. We are very grateful that you came to visit us today. And we're so glad that that baby bat learned to fly. Um, <laughs> you are- Thank you, Faye Brown. <laughs> I have a passion. I want to see you on stage. So keep me posted what you're doing. I definitely want to come see you. And I'd probably fly across the country. So you take care. And thank you so much for being on Determined Women. And everybody will see you next week with Airplay. Bye-bye. Thank you.